there's book sticky on my book. Anyways, today we are going to be recapping The Hidden Oracle by Rick Riordan. This is the first book in The Trials of Apollo, the fifth and final book of which is coming out very shortly. This is also a spin-off of the Percy Jackson and Heroes of Olympus series, so if you haven't read those, go read those, come back because there's going to be spoilers for those in here, and we'll get you ready for the next book. Our story starts off with the Greek sun god Apollo, who is fallen to earth and lands in a dumpster. He's been cursed by his dad Zeus to be mortal. He has none of his powers, none of his dashing good looks. He's actually in the body of a teenager named Lester Papadopoulos. He is then attacked by some thugs who say they were sent by a specific boss right after him. We'll have to see who's after Apollo later. Then he is saved by a demigod named Meg McCaffrey, who uses rotten fruit as her weapon of choice. He lets it slide that the last time this happened to him, he had to serve a demigod for a couple of years and then he had his godhood restored. Meg uses some quick thinking to snatch up his servitude. Meg appears to be a feral demigod. She hasn't been killed by monsters yet, but she's also not affiliated with any sort of camp. So Apollo wants to take her to Percy Jackson to take her to Camp Half-Blood. Percy says that he can't get involved with any sort of prophecies, wars, anything like that. He actually has to focus on school, his family, and his girlfriend, Annabeth. You know, going to Tartarus and back really can change a kid's perspective on things. But he's a nice guy, so he offers to at least take them to camp. On the way there, Apollo recounts the events from the last book series, The Heroes of Olympus. He thinks Zeus is mad at him because his son Octavian is the one who started the wars between the Greek and Roman camps, and there were some giants involved, so we can see why Zeus would be a little mad. Then they are attacked by some nosoi, or plague spirits. These guys are mad that Apollo took over their job of spreading disease, one of the many things Apollo is a god of. So they want to take that job back and start epidemics. Who let them things out of Tartarus again? Anyways, Meg uses some of her powers to create a Karpos, or a grain spirit, which takes the form of a peach attack baby. Peaches, as dubbed by Meg, takes care of these no soy, no problem. Percy ditches them and they head to the camp through the woods. This is where Apollo goes a little crazy. He hears a female's voice saying that she wants him to find her and save her. They arrive at camp, but Apollo passes out, where he then has some dreams about a hippie lady who says she wants him to find some gates and save them. Meanwhile, he has another dream about a man in a mauve jacket who says his goal is to burn these gates. Apollo awakes surrounded by his children Will, Austin, and Kayla. They take him to Chiron, the centaur of the camp, and he tells Apollo that communications with the outside world have been cut off, no text messages, emails, not even iris messages are going in or out. He also says that Python, a monster that Apollo has fought before, has returned from Tartarus and has claimed the Oracle of Delphi for himself, thus cutting off all prophecy to camp. If that's not bad enough, campers have been going missing, but they can't send anybody on a quest to find them without having any sort of prophecy. According to Apollo, it's a total catch-88. Meg is claimed by her mother Demeter, the Greek goddess of agriculture. Apollo and Demeter don't have a great history, but him and Meg are tied together now. They trudge through some camp activities where Apollo learns that he's not as good at music and archery as he used to be, so he makes an oath on the river Styx that he will not do either of those things again until he becomes a god. Him and Kayla also save a camper from wandering into the woods and disappearing. The camper said that he heard voices and just had to go check it out, but he was kind of in a trance. Up next on the camp activities is a three-legged death race through the labyrinth, which goes all around the world. It was previously closed, but now it's open again. You know, just normal camp activities. This race was created by Harvey, an eight-year-old son of Hephaestus, who is also working on a beacon to bring his half-brother Leo back. Leo and his automaton dragon Festus disappeared in the end of the last book series. We know what happened to him, but the campers don't, so Harvey is desperate to bring him back. During the three-legged death race, Meg and Apollo are on a team, and they actually run into Python himself. They hide and listen to a conversation he has with a man named The Beast, 
who is this man in this mauve suit? He says that he wants Meg and Apollo to open some gates so that he can burn them down. After the race, we find out that Austin and Kayla are missing. These are Apollo's own children. This is getting a little personal, don't you think? Meg also reveals that the Beast is the one who killed her father, and she was actually raised by her stepfather, the guy who gave her her pretty sweet sickle weapons. This is when Rachel Dare, the current Oracle, arrives back at camp. She says that there's a corporation out there who's been funding baddies for the past two book series now. It's called the Triumvirate, and it's made up of three Roman emperors, one of which we know is Nero himself. He's been kept alive by memories from a culture, which is our culture, thanks to the internet. Their goal is to control all five of the oracles, starting by burning the Grove of Dodona. This grove is actually an ancient source of prophecy that Apollo believes is hidden in the woods at camp right now. Equipped with a battle ukulele, him and Meg head into the woods. There, they run into a geyser god named Pete, who serves as kind of a PR rep for the woods at camp. He says that his friend Polly has gone missing too, but can't give the location of the grove because it'll lower their satisfaction surveys. Then they're attacked by some giant ants called Mermeeks. Apollo breaks his oath by singing to lure the ants away, but it backfires and curses him instead. Meg is then taken, and Apollo knows that he only has 24 hours to save her before she's eaten, so he heads back to camp to regroup. There, he recounts two tales of his past loves, the first of which is Daphne. We know the myth is that Eros shot Apollo in the heart with a golden arrow, making him fall in love with Daphne. But he shot Daphne with a lead arrow, making her want nothing to do with him. So he chased her so bad, she actually turned herself into a tree to get away from him. His second love was Hyacinthus, who was also loved by the West Wind God, Zephyros. Zephyros was so jealous, he killed Hyacinthus by blowing a discus into the side of his head so that Apollo couldn't have him. You gotta love those little myth nods thrown in there. I sure do. Apollo saves Meg, and they actually run into the queen ant herself, but he gives her an offering of a song and she lets them pass. They arrive at the gates of Dodona, where they find their missing demigod friends and the geyser god Polly tied up on stakes. Nero, the big baddie himself, shows up with two Germani, or his muscle in tow, and reveals that he is actually Meg's stepfather, and she has been working with him this entire time. She says that this beast version of him is a different version who killed her father. Really, it's just a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde situation, Meg. Come on, figure that out. He also reveals he's been attacking the gates over and over again, and every time the trees just cry out and another demigod wanders in. He even tried using the geyser god to open the gates, but wasn't successful. So Meg and Apollo open the gates, and the voices are still a little bit jumbled, so Nero really just wants to go ahead and burn the grove down. Meg is a daughter of Demeter, though, and can't let this happen. Apollo even tries to tell her that Nero's plan is to burn all of Long Island and start over with a new empire for himself, starting by burning their friends as human torches. Meg's not having any of this, so she rushes into the grove with some wind chimes that the titan Rhea gave her. These chimes are supposed to help focus the voice so that they can obtain some prophecy. Apollo and Peaches fight the two Germani, and he actually gets some of his powers back for a few minutes. Nero escapes, though, by burning some Greek fire. Apollo tries to put the fire out, but is unsuccessful, so some dryads, or nature spirits, sacrifice themselves and put the fire out. Apollo then rushes in after Meg, where he hears prophecy about himself. We're sure this is going to stick with us through the rest of these books, but it has to do with a lot of death, so Apollo's not super stoked about it. Meg is super ashamed that she's helped her stepfather and tricked Apollo, so she releases him from his servitude and runs away. Apollo then realizes that Nero's not done attacking. He's going to use his giant statue of himself, which is actually made in the image of Apollo himself, to attack camp. They ride the queen ant back and find the automaton attacking camp. Apollo's idea is to enchant an arrow he found in the grove with some plague to destroy the automaton, 
but it's actually from the trees and has magical power, so is speaking to him. He has to use another arrow, but it'll take too long to do what he needs to do. So Percy shows up to save the day, and he distracts the automaton long enough so that Apollo can enchant the arrow and shoot it into his ear canal. The automaton is then plagued with hay fever and sneezes so hard that he blows his own head off. After the battle, Apollo reveals his intentions of going to find Meg, save the rest of the oracles, and ultimately fight Python and restore the Oracle of Delphi. This is the only way he can have his god status returned to him. But he needs a team! Fortunately for him, Harvey's beacon starts working, and Festus the Automaton Dragon arrives with Leo and Calypso in tow. It seems that Leo has saved Calypso from her exiled island, but she's mortal now too and has no powers. Let's see who wears it best, shall we? With a team intact and ready to go, we'll have to see what adventures they get into in the next book, The Dark Prophecy. That's the end of the recap, guys. I hope you really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed reading this book and look forward to doing the rest of the series. So until next time, bye!